We're here in Nashville with Pulitzer Prize winning author and presidential historian John Meacham talking about the moral imperative to mitigate climate change and to repair the fabric of our democracy. John and David, great to be with you. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Andy, thank you. John, thanks for taking time to be here with us. Uh, this is a complicated subject. And it's the, it's the mashup of democracy that is dysfunctional, climate change, which is a long-term issue, and the fact that we haven't done what we should have done on these issues. Um, that's a spiritual question. You know, so for the, the duration of the, the program this, this day, uh, we've been talking about how these relate. And the first question I've got, and this, this is a big question, is, is democracy up to the challenge of self-repair dealing with climate change as a long-term and moral issue. And what do we bring to the table? What, what is it about American history that we bring to the table to give us hope? Well, I'm glad you asked me a simple question. Uh, it's a little <laughs> bit like, uh, besides that, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, it's, a, it's as fundamental a question as you can ask, because is democracy up to being democracy is also the uh, uh, an existential part of where we are at the moment. Mm -hmm. Democracy is full of possibility and it's full of peril because it's about us. And this is uh, the cleric's uh, realm more than mine, mm -hmm. but we're flawed, we're fallen, we're mm -hmm. fallible. Uh, you all are better people than I am, which is easy, so don't get too uh, cocky about that. But I know that if I do the right thing 51% of the time in the course of a day, mm -hmm. that's a pretty good day. And the country itself, democracy is like that because it's the fullest expression, the fullest manifestation of all of us. It's about our habits of heart and mind. It's about our appetites and our ambitions. It's about our aspirations and our more immediate uh, desire for gratification. Democracy is not particularly good at long-term planning uh, because we aren't particularly good at long-term planning as, as people. It takes an effort of will and a commitment to seeing that we are able to defer our immediate gratification for a long-term benefit. So it's like exercise, it's like diet, it's, we know it's good for us, mm -hmm. but it's not a lot of fun. Uh, but if we really want to change for the better, we have to commit to doing the work. And so is democracy up to the climate crisis? I think we have to believe that it is, but the f to, I would ask the first question or the, the a priori question, which would be each of us needs to ask ourselves, what are we willing to sacrifice for an ultimate good? What are we willing to give up now so that a world will endure, will be shaped that we might not participate in, but that we believe there will be a reward in the future looking back and saying that we in the present did the right thing. There's a great story about um, uh, right after Bloody Sunday, uh, John Lewis, of course, walking over the Pettus Bridge with Isaiah Williams and Selma is beaten on Sunday, March 7th. Uh, 1965, uh, then there, you know, in, in the popular mind, we then go from the scene at the bridge to President Johnson saying, we shall overcome. But that was eight days later. Mm -hmm. And part of what President Johnson did in those eight days was manage the situation. And one of the things he did is he brought George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, up to Washington. Mm -hmm. And Johnson had a very deep cushions on his sofa so other people would sink and he would loom even larger uh, over him. And Wallace comes in and he sinks down and uh, LBJ leans over him and says, George, when you're dead, do you want your grave to be a little scrawny thing that says George Wallace he hated? Or do you want it to be a beautiful marble statue that says George Wallace he built? 
It's a very important question. What do we want posterity to say about us? And if we want there to be a posterity, we have to get this right. Follow that up a little bit. What, if you could write, and you do help presidents write speeches, in the one president. All right. <laughs> it's not, it's I, not I, a generic thing. Well, what would you write to extend our horizon? Because climate change uh, is a long-term thing. There, there's no uh, quick fix solution for yeah. it. So how do we reorient a public? Lewis Mumford once said that capitalism works by propagating the seven deadly sins. And we're good at that. We were yeah. advertised. We, we each have hundreds or thousands of advertisements a day. So we're conditioned to be consumers, not citizens. But now uh, we have to reckon with citizenship in the natural world and- That's a key phrase, what you just used, is that we have to put our impulse for citizenship ahead of our default position to consume. Yeah. That's the whole thing. We can stop now. Now, you're, <laughs> you're, you're, you're an artist with words. Uh, how would you frame that in a speech? for a future president? How do we begin to redirect our attention to the longer term, knowing it's going to be sacrifice? Yeah. And climate change poses this dilemma in that it's not solvable, it's, not, it's hard to get people to understand they have to think long term, whether board executives or the average uh, citizen. Yeah. So how do we begin to ignite that conversation or begin the conversation? What's the one how thing do you want? Do? It's, it's for, what do we want the future to say of us? Right. It's like those resume virtues versus eulogy virtues yes. that David Brooks talks about. Yeah. Yes. What's our legacy? Do you want a scrawny grave that says, <laughs> Pine board. Yeah. George Wallace, you hate it? Or do you want a big marble thing that says, George Wallace, you built? And I, I sometimes, when I talk to politicians, um, with politicians, mostly you listen, but when you, occasionally when you, when you talk, <laughs> kind of like priests yeah, yeah. uh, and academics. The first uh, half of what I say is helpful. <laughs> um, I, I have what I call the portrait test, mm -hmm. which is what do you want us to think when we look at your portrait? And politicians love this because they can't imagine a world where we're not looking at their portrait, <laughs> right? What do you want? And you, you get a, President Clinton once said this, presidents get a sentence. Generations tend to get a sentence, you know, in the fullness of time. So what I would, the way I would articulate this is it is given to, in the words of the great poem in him, you know, once to every man and nation comes a moment to decide. And at Lexington Concord, we made a decision. Mm -hmm. At Normandy, we made a decision. At Selma, we made a decision. Let it be our decision now in Atlanta today for this group to say that when future generations look back, they will say that something began here, mm -hmm. that a better world grew from this moment. Because we think chronologically, life unfolds in an Augustinian sense. It is a journey of the soul. We believe that there is a linear element, mm -hmm. a linear infrastructure to the world. We are on a journey toward a, a, the fullness uh, of re-communion with God. And without getting into N.T. Wright, you know, what, what heaven is, you know, it's, it's not necessarily up there. It's going to be a regenerated world here. And so what can we do? to move on that path with, in a phrase, FDR wrote at Warm Springs, not far from where uh, this meeting is, with strong and active faith. Mm -hmm. Follow up on that just, just a little bit. You and Tim McGraw did a book on uh, music, and it's a great book. I thought it was a project with Faith Hill, and then McGraw showed up. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Your, your neighbors, I think. Yeah, we are. He showed yeah. up to mow your grass. He showed, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, I, I wonder how, in this world, this, this is a part of the question of leadership, but how do we heal this, or begin to heal, this uh, relationship between red America, blue America, rural, urban America? Yeah. And what part of that? Uh, I, lo I love the idea of music being part of that bridge. 
you can hear one of the reasons Tim and I did that, and it was actually Tim's idea, uh, which I, in the early on in an early draft, I quoted Thoreau, and I, I realized that McGraw thought Thoreau was a running back for LSU. So there was a lot, we had a lot of, it was a learning curve. Um, you can listen to, I find that you can listen to a song that articulates a viewpoint different from yours in a way that you cannot listen to a speech on the same topic, mm -hmm. right? So my favorite example of this is there's always these divisions, the red-blue divisions. We've been divided from the beginning. 20% of us didn't want to break away from Great Britain. Uh, we fought a war, a civil war, a brutal civil war. You know, onward, onward, all the examples are self-evident. And music has represented that, interestingly. Uh, so we shall overcome uh, versus Dixie. Uh, the Union, uh, the Battle Hymn of the Republic mm -hmm. versus Dixie during the Civil War. Two sets of lyrics for my country tis of thee. Brother, can you spare a dime versus happy days are here again. Uh, the Ballad of the Green Berets versus mm -hmm. Blowing in the Wind. Uh, born in the USA and God bless the USA, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it tracks along. And so I do think music can play that, that role. I don't know that we will ever, in, the, in this mortal coil, uh, heal, fully heal these divisions. The divisions are inherent. Mm -hmm. um, what democracy, to bring this full circle, what democracy does is it creates a set of rules, a set of commonly agreed upon uh, boundaries in which just enough of us decide on one course, we try it, if it doesn't work, or if people decide it doesn't work, then we do it a different way. But we remain in conversation and in right. tension with each other without being in literal conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. That's what makes this particular political moment so different. From 1789 until 2021, no American president, if they thought of it, they didn't act on it, attempted to thwart the peaceful transfer of power attempted basically to interrupt democracy, to bend it solely for mm -hmm. that person's purposes. That has happened in the last 20 minutes, uh, historically speaking. And so you ask about the capacity of democracy to confront something like climate change. The first question it has to answer is can democracy perpetuate itself? And once it perpetuates itself, then we can apply our hearts, minds, brains to this larger issue. And so I think that's, I think that's critical. Well, I was going to jump in. So in 1860, though about to be Confederates, saw a weak point in democracy, specifically in mm -hmm. the certification of the Electoral College. Yep. And so before Lincoln's election was certified, they similarly, similarly saw that moment as their best opportunity to thwart the transfer of power. They did, and John Breckinridge did the right thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. John Breckinridge was the Mike Pence of the era, or Mike Pence mm -hmm. is the John Breckinridge. John Breckinridge from Kentucky uh, had run for president in 1860, uh, had lost, came in uh, just below Stephen Douglas, and was vice president. It was his job to certify or not the electoral votes. As vice president. As vice president. Mm -hmm. He was a sitting vice president, Buchanan's vice president, and later became a Confederate officer and Confederate cabinet official. But he did his duty because he had sworn an oath to that Constitution. He would then try to undo that Constitution, but not while an officer of it. What? What is that? That is character. Moral clarity. That is a moral position. 
That's why I think communities of faith have something to say about this, because I think one of the things we do is we practice our ethics in front of each other. We get together and we tell these stories and we say we have a role to play in this. I think we have something to say about that. John, before, before going there, what's the case? If you were uh, talking to a group of skeptics about democracy, of whom there are many, yeah. I mean, democracy is uh, worldwide shows up uh, losing ground to no. some other kind of autocratic solutions or whatever. What's the short case for you for democracy? How would you explain that in the shortest possible uh, phraseology to the skeptics? Democracy protects the possibility that you won't be bullied. It, wa it doesn't necessarily guarantee it, but it represents the best chance for you to make a case and not be pushed around by somebody who just happens to be bigger. Yeah. You're about to go into a class. You got yeah. 1,100 students uh, in a couple hours. What would you tell them about democracy? What, what's the message we in education have to convey to young people? How do we build a constituency for this long haul? It's a little bit like, you know, you can always, Winston Churchill is, he always preaches. Uh, it, it's the worst form of government except for all the others, right? Um, because it's the most human. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. It's the most human and yet it's the most counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive for me to grant that you all have equal standing in the world, that your views are as legitimate as mine. I would rather not do that. Of the three, if the three of us had to vote on something, I would like to win. Mm -hmm. But if you two decide, then I have to give up. And as President Biden has said, you can't love your country, you can't love democracy only when you win. Is it possible in this calculation to grant standing of a legal sort, uh, the Constitution mentions posterity one time, that's in the preamble, should future generations be included in this kind of intergenerational democracy? This is a big question. Yeah. You don't have to go there if you don't want no, to. But no, no, sure. I mean, I think the future is, my friend who's marvelous on all these questions, of course, a, a singular leader on it, Al Gore, uh, talked a lot about this. The future is an act of faith, right? It's grounded in history. Our tradition is based on remembrance. Remember the days of old, remember the years of many generations. Ask thy fathers and they will tell thee, thy elders and they will show thee. That's from the Song of Moses. Do this in remembrance of me, the most obeyed commandment ever in human history. Was such a commandment ever obeyed? Right, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, you got to love a conversation where you're quoting an Anglican monk. This may be the only place this ever happens. Uh, so um, it's rooted in that, mm -hmm. but it's not about the past. It's about this conversation. One of the ways I think about history is it's a conversation between the present and the past to shape the future. And so I would argue that people of faith are particularly well equipped and ought to be particularly well disposed toward assessing data, mm -hmm. assessing a tradition, assessing the present state of things, and deciding on a course of action that will make today and tomorrow better than yesterday. Isn't that, in fact, what we do when we come to the altar? Right? It makes the world new again, however briefly. It reminds us of the most extraordinary act of sacrificial love that we've uh, chosen to commemorate. And so if, if God can do all of that, can't we buy an electric truck? I mean, you know, we're not asking people to go to the cross, or asking them to go to a charging station. If you could run the film fast forward to say the year 2100, 
and we made it through this poly crisis here, this uh, interacting, intersecting kind of problems, climate change, inequality, war, and so forth. But we made it. What happened between 2025, let's say, and the year 2100? What did we do right? And the other, the other half of the question is, what does the church, what's the role of the church in catalyzing those events? To answer them in, in reverse order, um, the role of the church is also the role of the citizen, which is the church is a sacred institution, but it is in fact a human one. Mm -hmm. it, is, it dwells in time and space, but its cares and concerns are about the eternal. And the closest we can come to eternal uh, in a fallen world is that kind of century-long question. So I would argue, leaving aside what the policy mm -hmm. questions would be, I think what, what would have happened is enough of us decided that the future was worth present sacrifice. And we've done it before. We are, for the last 80 years, we have lived in a world where certain state powers had the capacity to d destroy huge swaths of human life with nuclear weapons. We have invested, the United States, the people, the American people, with ferocious fights, have invested in a national security apparatus, have projected force, NATO, we put troops around the world, people have sacrificed, people have died in order to prevent cataclysm. And again, we've had arguments about this, but we did invest for a future that could be, to, to hedge against a future that could be cataclysmic. Right. That was an argument that Truman made, it was an argument that Eisenhower made, it was actually an argument all the way through. Uh, from 1945, uh, really until 2016, and then it began to get a little wobbly, then it was restored, and now it could be wobbly again, right? The commitment to collective security. It, the analogy is imperfect, but, it, but it's not, it's worth thinking about. We spent time and treasure and blood to hedge against a threat that had real effects but at its worst was in fact theoretical. That's not, there, that dog might be worth taking out to hunt, uh, is that the post-World War II security apparatus against first Soviet tyranny and now chaotic, this is one of your poly crises, now uh, building a national security system that would prevent the worst things from happening. Expensive, perspective, required persuasion, uh, and was founded on the argument that a little bit of pain now keeps something worse from happening, mm -hmm. which is fundamentally one of the arguments that has to be made here. Uh, you're working on a book on Eisenhower. At the end of his administration, he seemed to be saying something kind of different than he had said throughout the, his administration. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, what would have happened, was there a different path in 1960 than going forward from 1960 in the Kennedy administration and so forth that was, would have been more centered on peace, common security, uh, perhaps reigning in the military industrial establishment, as he called it. Yeah. I mean, was there a different path at that point that we might have walked? Oh, there are always different paths, um, which is part of, it's one of our hopes, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> is that there are different paths. Yeah. Um, I think that, it's funny, President Eisenhower's, uh, the most memorable thing he said, he said with about 72 hours to go, uh, as, as president, 
Same, same was true of George Washington, you know, the, the warning about party spirit and entangling alliances. Farewell addresses are, are, can be important. Um, of course there was. Uh, and did we get everything right? Absolutely not. Uh, at least 60,000 Americans, 55,000 Americans die in Vietnam. Uh, interesting, isn't it, parenthetically, how Vietnam, which was the dominant question for so long, mm -hmm. It's interesting how that it's feeling more and more remote. It is right. It it's not quite Spanish-American War yet, but it's it's moving um, as as time goes on. Um, what President Truman, what President Eisenhower, President Kennedy uh, were trying to do was keep the worst thing from happening. And one of our fellow Episcopalians, George H.W. Bush, his first question used to always be not what can I do about it, but how can I keep something worse from happening? Mm -hmm. Which is not a glamorous trumpet kind of thing, but a really good way to start most conversations. Good way to think about climate change as well. Yeah. I mean, how do you keep the thing yeah. manageable? John, this is a relation to, because I think you could think about communities of faith as containers of hope. Mm -hmm. Jürgen Moltmann is sort of seen as the theologian of hope. I wonder if there's a meaningful way to engage hope. Mm. You're certainly wanting to prevent the worst from happening, but is there a way to articulate also there's a more prosperous, there's a more abundant, there's a more just future that's, that's a hopeful and promised future? And I think that, I think that conversation about um, incentivizing the right way forward, the, the wiser way forward, is pretty well developed, right? Um, it's a question of scale, isn't it? I mean, isn't that, I mean, we, don't we basically know what to do? Would you agree with that? I do. I so do. it's scale. Well, this is what makes it uh, an interesting subject. I think we knew in 1977 uh, that energy efficiency was the way to go forward. Renewable energy would come along. I mean, we had, it wasn't a technological problem. I think we've learned it's not even an economic issue. It's a spiritual issue. Why didn't we act? when we knew better, and we knew better than we were acting. So yeah, very much. John, I've got one. one so so it's, it's, it's God and mammon. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, or the mana economy, right? The mammon economy is yeah. build more bricks. And the mana economy is there's an abundance that God wants for everybody equally. You know, I wonder, in that vein, Andy, I wonder if there's an irony in all of this. Somehow taking care of future generations is actually an act of self-interest in the present generation. Totally. And doing what's necessary for the longer term, and I think this is built into some the old Cherokee uh, or Iroquois effort of uh, protecting seven generations out. Yeah. It was good for you at the current time. Um, I made my living in education, as you have in part. And so the question for us last week at a, a meeting in Tempe, Arizona, at Arizona State University, was what, what's the obligation of universities and colleges to educate a citizenry for the long term? The, the question I'd like to end uh, our conversation with is, what do churches do now? And they're scattered across a, an ideological mm -hmm. uh, range in, in different faith groups and so forth. And Christian nationalism is a major force uh, uh, throughout the whole country. So what, what, do, what do churches do? What does this audience that you're speaking to now, what do they do within their own congregations? And what can happen in this very fertile zone called Atlanta where John Lewis and Martin Luther King and Jimmy Carter mm -hmm. and so many very, very heroic people uh, uh, carved out a, a, a different vision of the future. So what do, you, what do you recommend to the audience that's watching this, the church crowd? What's the old line? Uh, Preach the gospel always, if necessary, use words. Um, I, think, I think if solutions are clear, then just start doing it. Uh, you have to incentivize others to come along with you, right? You can't just tell them, mm -hmm. right? You got to show them. And so I think, I think the argument, and George is a great 
example. It's not just Atlanta, right? Atlanta is one thing, and right. the rest of the state, uh, many parts of it, is is, is something else. Uh, I grew up in Chattanooga, you know, so um, North Georgia and Atlanta. I don't know if you all have diplomatic relations <laughs> anymore. <laughs> you get your passport stamped in Rome uh, on the way down. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, not to be glib about it, I think that there is a religious, there's a religious case to be made for democracy. There is a religious case to be made for a climate agenda. There's a religious case to be made for national defense. There's a religious case to be made for uh, economic justice. And not just, that's not code for, let's take every, everybody, let's have the government take everybody's money. I pay plenty of taxes, I'm good. Um, but I do believe that we are, by history, faith, and experience, we are called to give as well as take. Mm -hmm. And our default position is to take. Third chapter of Genesis. Mm -hmm. There's the fruit. There's the fruit, I want it, right? So my argument for people who are in ecclesiastical communities or in churches is find somebody who disagrees with you, which shouldn't be hard, uh, and make the case. Not in a hostile way, not in an aggressive way, but walk them through. Walk them through, you know, would, and it's, is it necessary that Jesus would drive an electric car? I don't know. I mean, I'll leave that to you all. Um, probably, maybe. Um, we're, we're in a... It's given to few generations to have this number. You, your polycrisis phrase is a good one. To have this number of questions. And to resolve one way or the other. And we're going to know pretty soon mm -hmm. whether, whether we make it. And so if I were a churchgoer in Atlanta, I think I would do everything I could to incentivize to make as appealing as possible the path you want to follow, the path you think people should take. And it requires telling the story. That's the story I want to ask you about is the story of soul force. And you talk about yeah. with John Lewis, the power of hope. Can you tell a story about soul force making a difference coming out of Atlanta for the country? Oh my goodness. Well, without SNCC, without the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, without Nashville, I have to put in a plug here, uh, and James Lawson, uh, who taught Congressman Lewis and Diane Nash and James Bevel and Bernard Lafayette. Um, a majority of Americans never really favored what Dr. King wanted, if you look at the, the public polling. Soul Force, the story that John Lewis told was that the Declaration of Independence and the Gospel of Jesus required a change in behavior. Mm -hmm. And he was willing to walk into the fire for that. Not all of us have to do that. If that were the, if that were the requirement, everybody would leave, right? But you can tell that story. And one of the ways I think of it is, is there anyone who would admit that if they could go back in time, they would not want to be standing next to John Lewis walking across that bridge? Who would want to... Who would admit that they would want to be one of the posse men or the troopers? That's a great question. Hmm. Mm -hmm. You want to be on the bridge. Yeah. You want to be on the bridge then, you want to be on the bridge now. So get on the bridge. 
John and David, thank you for this conversation, time together here in Nashville. We're going to pass it now back to Bishop Wright in Atlanta. And I have it on good authority that he's about to ask you to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, do not leave this room until you've committed to do something where you are in your neighborhood. Thanks, John. Thanks, David. Back to you, Bishop Wright. <laughs>